I want to thank you all for being here this morning. I'm so excited that we've got this chance. I had planned a lesson and started writing a lesson on how do we know when God is speaking to us, which I think goes at the core of some of the groups we've been discussing, whether it's Islam and Muhammad convinced he was hearing the voice of the Lord, or Mormonism and Joseph Smith believing that it was God through his his angels that, that were, were uh, appeared to him and, and spoke to him. How do we believe that God still communicates today? But that lesson is now being rolled to next Sunday because I found out Stephen, Dr. Bolivant, was going to still be here today. He flies back to England to join his wife and, and two children uh, this afternoon. But he would still be here and he said uh, he was going to uh, look for a place to attend worship this morning. And I said, have I got a place for you? And he said, uh, hey, I'm in. And then I said, well, would you come to our class? And he said, sure. And then I said, well, could I interview you for class? And, he, and one thing led to another, and now he's stuck here. So I brought two of his books. He's got a number of books, but I brought two that if you've got some interest in, uh, you may want to read. Now, I'm going to be upfront and honest with you. I've only read one of his two books that I've got here today. I'm going to start the second one as soon as I get a chance. But I read his book on the Trinity. And I can tell you, it's the best book on the Trinity I've ever read. And if you've ever wondered about the Trinity, we're going to discuss it here this morning. But if you've ever wondered about the Trinity, this is the book to get. I'll put it on the Elmo so you can see. Uh, I even like the subtitle, The <laughs> Trinity. How, let me make this a little bit bigger. The Trinity, how not to be a heretic. That's pretty good stuff here <laughs> by Dr. Stephen Bulliman. Um, uh, Stephen teaches at St. Mary's University in Twickenham, England. Twickenham's a kind of between London and it's a suburb of London yeah, out toward is. Oxford. Big rugby town. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's the big rugby stadiums, stadiums there. Yeah. That's right. Um, which is what they do instead of our football, uh, which their football is not our football anyway. Their football, they actually use their feet, picture that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, all of that by, as it is. Now, I want to talk to Stephen. I want to interview Stephen. I want Stephen to do most of the teaching this morning as I kind of direct it and teach it. But I got to tell you all something I did not learn about him until this morning. You may not realize this, but I am a huge, and I think a lot of you do realize it, a huge Bob Dylan fan. I mean, I love the Bob. I think the Bob is amazing. I like his songs. I like his poetry. I like his hair. <laughs> I, I like his hats. He plays a mean harmonica. He writes a great waltz. I like the Bob. Stephen is a Bob fanatic, maybe more so than me, and is the first person I've ever met who came to know Jesus because of Bob Dylan. That's true. So I think we got to start with the Bob. <laughs> so Stephen, tell us about how Bob Dylan played a role in you coming to know Jesus. Yeah, well, um, I was brought up in, in Britain, uh, wasn't baptized, would have considered myself an atheist, was an atheist at uh, high school. And um, this only really struck me. I had a period of ill health at the end of last year. And, and I was listening to, to some of the, the gospel albums of Bob Dylan, particularly an album called Saved, which if you ever read the kind of the list of the, you know, the ranked order of, you know, Bob Dylan albums, it's always comes in like last or, or second to last in the critics' estimation. And listening to this uh, CD, it, I was transported back to being 17, 18, and, and listening to every bit of Bob Dylan I could get my hands on. Um, bootleg recordings, you know, I'd go out, I'd fly out to, to see, you know, show after show after show in a row on tour. Um, and I had vivid memories flooding back of some of these songs, intensely charismatic, gospel songs, and being, remembering being moved by these uh, at the age of 17, 18. Um, you know, really vivid recollections. 
And it occurred to me in retrospect that, you know, it, it was a long time before I then, you know, found Jesus and, and, and was baptized. Um, you know, that was 2008. You know, we're talking kind of six years before that, maybe more. But it struck me that the only way, the only way I would have subjected myself to a heavily evangelical presentation of the gospel was if Bob Dylan was singing it. That, that, <laughs> there, there was no way on earth I was going to voluntarily put that in my ears <laughs> unless it was, you know, and, and that just applied to just Bob Dylan's. You know, I've got Bob Dylan doing, you know, this old man. I mean, you know, <laughs> I just listen to anything. But it struck me that hearing that, hearing the conviction, and any of you know those albums, we were talking about them earlier, the conviction, the power the biblical literacy behind the lyrics. But more than that, just the charismatic passion. Looking back was, was clearly some of the first stirrings of grace. And it, there was no kind of immediate conversion after that. But, you know, in, in this isn't the place to tell the story next time I'm here, but in a kind of a tangled tapestry of, in retrospect, providence leading me, to, to kind of where I am now, here. Um, Bob Dylan was kind of one of the first heralds of the gospel for me. And the, the, we talked about this before. And Bob Dylan did these big gospel tours um, in, in the early 80s, late 70s. And, you know, these were big stadiums, people there to hear kind of the Bob Dylan they liked. And he used to give these kind of way out um, impromptu sermons from the stage that, while, be, while being booed by his own fans. And there's one in them when he's talking about, well, when I, in the 60s, I used to go around and people used to keep trying to tell me I was a prophet. People used to kind of read my lyrics for kind of, you know, what was happening. People used to go through my garbage for kind of relics. And I used to tell them, look, I'm not a prophet. And now I come around telling people about Jesus Christ and they say, hey, Bob Dylan, he's no prophet. But he was for me. That's pretty cool, huh? <clears throat> All because, so, so the reason we got into this is I said to Stephen when we were eating breakfast this morning, <laughs> oh, I, yeah. said, I said, you know, I haven't read Faith and Unbelief yet, but I can't look at it without thinking about there's this Bob Dylan uh, line in a Bob Dylan song called Precious Angel, where Bob says, you either got faith or you got unbelief, and there ain't no neutral ground. And, and I said, uh, I just can't get that out of my head. And he says, well, of course, that's because I'm a Dylan freak. And, uh, uh, and I said, wait, wait, wait. And if I had known that early enough, we would not be talking about the Trinity this morning. This hey. entire class would have been built off of Bob Dylan lines. And what does it mean when God said to Abraham, kill me a son? <laughs> Abe said, man, you must be putting me right on. This will sell. But... <laughs> You've been spared that. So Stephen is, let me tell, ask him one more preparatory question, and then we're going to dig into the Trinity for you this morning. By the way, Stephen is probably the only college professor you've ever seen who has taught a course on the Trinity. I mean, like, taught a course on it. Kids paid tuition money to learn what you're getting for <laughs> nothing this morning. And you even got donuts and coffee. So this is like incredible bounty from the Lord this morning. Um, um, Stephen, what are you doing in the United States of America, away from your sweet wife, who may be watching this, but you want to give her a shout out, the camera right there. Yeah. If she's uh, on the... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs> Once I'm done here, I'm coming back, so... Um, uh, he, he texted his wife because of the wonders of our amazing people who work on the internet and the, the help of this church, we're able to put this live simulcast on the web and through Facebook and the website as well and through the church website, three different avenues to get there. And so I told him, he said, well, I'll text my wife. Maybe she'll watch. And so, uh, hey, I don't know you, but I like your husband. Um, <laughs> thing is, I just know that my five-year-old daughter will be sitting there saying, Daddy looks fat. <laughs> Um, five-year-old daughter, he had two breakfasts this morning. <laughs> he ate the Grand Slam Super Deluxe Galindo breakfast. Brown. He's a big hash brown fan. And then he got a donut when he came in here. So I'm just saying. 
Um, what are you doing in the US? Um, uh, there's a guy at, at HBU, Jerry Johnson, who I've met a couple of times in England. He's doing a bit, all, all kinds of cool stuff, actually. Um, but he's doing a big documentary looking at the rise of the nuns, the people who say they have no religion. Um, and in many cases, uh, you know, this is a big area of my, my, my research, especially people who were brought up with some kind of religious background who, it's not just that they don't practice, it's that they no longer even tick the box, okay? And in Britain, half the population tick no religion when asked, what's your religion? And it's, as we know, it's, it, it's rising here. So, so Jerry uh, is doing a, a big documentary thing and interviewing all kinds of people, and he found me somehow. We've met a couple of times, and he said, come over to Houston, and, you know, we'll meet some cool people. Um, <laughs> sure, sounds great. Uh, and, and so we did. So this week I've been, some meetings at HBU, I was up at Baylor um, in Waco, um, and I met Mark on Monday at his library. Yeah, and it was a really neat, uh, 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 fortuitous chance. First of all, it was bizarre I was even there. And uh, uh, then when we got to meet, and I got to read up, and I got to study, and I got to talk to Stephen, it, it's just been a tremendous, tremendous chance and a, and a real blessing to me, but it's a blessing to us that I could grab him and steal him for today. Um, so he's, he's doing a research project, or they're doing, y'all are doing it under the Templeton grant Yeah, or we something. just had a big uh, multi-million dollar grant called Understanding Unbelief to, on the one hand, Delve more deeply into the nuns and the rise of them. And, and let, let me interrupt for just a moment. Nuns. He's not talking about a rising of Catholic yeah. women pledged to the Lord. That's not the rising of the nuns. I, I can see my Baptist brothers and sisters in here thinking, oh my gosh, the Catholic nuns are coming. No. The <laughs> nuns. Of the U.S. population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the nuns that are growing in number that big are N-O-N-E-S, as in no religion. What's your religious affiliation? None. So these are the nuns that are rising in number that he's talking about. Now, go ahead. Sorry, I had to translate that a little bit. Yep, so we got this big grant to dig more deeply into the statistics. Every so often there's a media report of whatever even bigger proportion, lots of young people. Um, but... One of the things I'm really interested in is, well, we think of the nuns as, as this kind of mass, but once you get to a quarter of the population, quarter of the adult US population, or half the British population, then you're talking about all kinds of people. And you're talking about not just this group of people who are different, but we're talking about our own friends, family members, children, former church members. Um, so this is a, a, a huge topic. So we're, we're trying to Explore that more, but also see what it looks like in other countries. There's been a lot of work in North America, a lot of work in Western Europe. What does it look like in Japan, Brazil, Iceland? Um, so we're just at the very, this month is the very start of this big project. So hopefully there'll be, there'll be more to tell you next time I'm here. Uh, fantastic. Now, Stephen was a nun, when he, an atheist, when he started university yep. at Oxford yep. and took his undergraduate, his master's, and his DPhil doctorate at yep. Oxford and uh, came to know the Lord in the process of all of that, and came to faith, and, and uh, uh, it's an interesting personal journey that we may get to. But now he's in a position and has been teaching at St. Mary's University in Twickenham since... 2009. 2009. And one of the classes he teaches is on the Trinity. And he decided he needed to write a textbook on the Trinity because it was easier than... than uh, uh, the material that was out there, I guess? What, what, what caused you to write it? Well, basically, the, you know, I was asked to give, you know, I'd, I'd studied this um, at undergrad and the early church history and, and the scriptural origins. And then suddenly I had to teach it and I had 13 weeks of, you know, hungover undergraduates to try and <laughs> communicate something about the very heart of the Christian message. All right, that's, that's, a, big, that's a big responsibility. Um, and so, you know, it, it took me a while to kind of think through the, the logic of how, how best to approach that and the, the narrative. And it, it seemed to work. And it was a class I really enjoyed teaching and, and you know, a kind of it, odd little anecdotes and stuff got thrown in as we went. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I just sat down hour every morning and just tried to write this little book. Um, the book's amazing. It's very easy to read. And yet it doesn't 
it, it doesn't so simplify matters that, that he has taken the mysteriousness of, of God's nature and reduced it down to something that, that is, is pablum. And, and so I strongly recommend the book. Now, here's, here's, let me put this into perspective for just a moment. Um, we left Christmas Day and went to see our family over in, in England. And Becky and I were running late to a meeting one day. I guess it was about two or three days after Christmas, and things were pretty sedate in England, uh, in, in it's London. It always is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this was an unusually sedate day in London. And uh, um, Becky and I are walking to the meeting, and there's a, a lady who's not particularly well-dressed, doesn't look particularly engaging, uh, looks like almost a street uh, uh, preacher of sorts, maybe? And she's standing there with brochures, and there's nobody on the street except me and Becky. And as we walk by, she said, would you like a brochure or a pamphlet? And, and we politely, uh, and I had Becky on this side, and the lady was on this side, so I was doing the talk. I said politely, no, thank you, as we continued to walk. Usually those are handouts for go to this restaurant or go to this pub or go to this whatever. But I saw... And it just took it a minute to register, and I was a few steps past that her brochure had God on it. And so I realized, aha. So I said to Becky, hang on, we're doing okay time-wise, i got to go back. So I went back and I said, uh, I'm sorry, I would love one of your brochures. Please give me one of your brochures. And she handed it to me, and it was basically something about God. And, and I looked at it, and, and uh, uh, it was, it was pro-God, wasn't an anti-God piece. And I, so I wanted to digest it as quickly as I could, didn't have a lot of time, so I flipped it over to see where it was printed. It was Watchtower publication, so I knew it was a Jehovah's Witness publication. And so I quickly was able to, the pieces fell into place, I knew who I was dealing with. And I said to her, I said, I see, uh, she said, do you know who God is? And I said, yes, I'm a very fervent uh, Christian. Uh, my faith is, is integral to my life, and, uh, uh, and, and I, I thank you for your brochure. And I thank you that, that you're dedicated to what you believe enough to stand out here on a cold, uh, uh, bleary morning. And, and, um, um, and she said, well, do, do, you, do you believe in, in uh, and, I, and I said, I believe in God. Uh, I believe in Jesus. I said, but I believe that Jesus is fully God. And she said, oh, so you believe in the Trinity. And I said, yes, I do. And I understand as a Jehovah's Witness, you don't. I said, and I don't have a lot of time to engage with you on it. But I, and she said, well, and she asked me about a passage in John, and I said, yes, I understand that passage in John, and and I understand how you what you believe it to mean. And she asked about Colossians and Jesus being the firstborn of creation, and I said, yes, and I know that passage as well. And 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 uh, uh, here's you know what I understand it to mean. I said, it, but but you've got some issues as well. Um, you've got to try and handle the Philippians passage where God, uh, Paul says that Jesus' name is above every other name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And I said, if God and Jesus aren't the same, then you've got God the Father bowing his knee to Jesus. Well, no, he would never do that. I said, exactly. So you've got a little problem here, and I want you to pray about it and think about it, and i got to go, and God loves you. And... Uh, <laughs> I'd love to tell you I sat there and just blew off our meeting and led her to the understanding what, who Jesus was, but I didn't. I fled. And, um, but it's, it's so interesting because her parting words to me were words of identification. So you're a Trinity guy, a believer? And I said, yes. And her response was something on the order of one plus one plus one equals three not one. And she didn't say it that way. That, that, that's the way, but that, that was the import of her message, which is actually what drew me back to talk to her a little bit more. So I, I couldn't leave it there. But Stephen, Dr. Bullivant, one plus one plus one does not equal one, it equals three. Talk to us. Right. Well, I mean, this is precisely the reason why I think the Trinity is so important, because 
Christians know that the Trinity is something important. They know it's, it's how we, what we call God. Um, and they, for the most part, are probably confident there's a good reason why we do that. And that some guy, maybe Mark knows, and we're, that's fine by me. You know. um, but it's a trouble when people don't feel confident in talking about it. Either because they can't tell people outside what this means, why we mean it, why it just isn't nonsense, because one plus one plus one equals three sounds nonsensical. It is. But also, for Christians themselves to have kind of this, this black hole in the middle of their faith that they don't feel like they're standing on firm ground, is really difficult for them. And, and especially, I think, when you get then Christians who don't know the faith who then read something like The God Delusion or something like a, a Watchtower tract that kind of tells them what, what Christians mean by the Trinity, and it's obviously nonsense. Then they think, yeah. And if that's, if that's nonsense, the very central most bit of the Christian message is nonsense, then what about the rest of it? And it's important to, and the difficulty also is that words like Trinity and and the more technical terms that that get used to explain it, like consubstantial or hypostasis, usia, these aren't biblical words, okay? And that, again, makes people nervous. What, why, why are we saying something at the heart of our faith and can only be described in this technical jargon? isn't biblical words. Now, Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin, they don't agree about everything. But they do agree that the reason we have words like Trinity and and, and the other set of jargon that goes with any specialist field is precisely in order to defend the biblical revelation. And this conviction that Trinity is Christianity's most basic description of who God is, who God has revealed himself to be, and who God has to be in order to save us. And the whole kind of next 300 years of of church history and fighting, essentially, um, and wrangling over the doctrine and words, is the church trying to make sense of these amazing, we've heard the word amazing a lot this morning, these amazing things that have been revealed to the early Christians. And they're trying to get their heads around them, and they're trying to be faithful to what's been revealed to them. And because of the nature of the thing that's doing the revealing about itself, about God revealing who he is, trying to do it in ways we understand, that takes them a while to get their head around it because human language just, just isn't built for that kind of stuff. It's not built for a lot of things, actually. It's not built for talking about feelings. It's not built about talking about anything much beyond very simple physical things. Every time we, we try and talk beyond that, every time I try and talk about what my wife and daughters mean to me, then I either say, well, I can't quite explain it, I'm lost for words, or I start using metaphors. And if I can't talk in literal, straight terms about the thing, A, that's most important to me, but B, that I'm the world's expert on, my own feelings about my own family, then it's not a surprise that we find it difficult and the church takes its time with some detours and dead ends along the way to find a way to talk about God. Okay, I'm faithful to how God reveals himself. I'm going to interrupt long enough to put this up for everyone to see. This is an illustration that you've put in your book. Um, How are we doing (laughs) screen-wise? I see one of our screens are working, one of our screens is not, and one of our screens is stuck. All of those make this impossible for anyone to see this picture other than me. It's a great picture. I have to say it's the best picture you've yeah, you're, you're, this we've, we've is We've got the artwork. best pictures, okay? 
tremendous ah. pictures. Okay, we've got two screens working <laughs> oh, <no>. now. <laughs> Here is your picture. Yeah. Now, this is class participation. Shout it out, be loud, be proud. What is this? A flower, yeah, we've got a flower. We got That's, a flower. Yeah. Either that or the plug. <laughs> yeah, we got a flower. Anybody got any ideas? Butterflies. They're big though. They're and uh, what? a pig person. A pig person. A pig person. Any, okay. Anyone else? You're going to have to shout. Okay. A drone. Well, I want to tell you something. I've, I've covered it up. I'm sorry. I want to tell you something. Be nice. That's Stephen's mother. Right. And the best part is that you know that my wife and daughters are watching this. Well, my parents are staying with them while I'm away. So my mother has just heard, whoever it was, who said pig person, say pig person to a picture of her. This is, and what, what kind of hospitality is this? <laughs> and I won't, I won't mention Gwen Chalette's name because I don't want it out there. <laughs> You're welcome, Gwen. Um, this Shame. is a marvelous illustration. I want to tell you the three things I want us to cover on the Trinity. I want us to cover why it's so difficult for us to discuss and to think and to know the truth of the Trinity. And then I want the Trinity defined in a useful way that you can easily remember. And then I want to discuss the heresies that happen if you deny the parts of the Trinity that are um, in the definition. So let's begin with the first thing I want us to do. The difficulty of understanding the Trinity. Yep. You've got the picture. You put the parable or the, the story, the illustration in the book. I thought it was splendid. Would you tell us about it? Yeah, this is the way out because theologians like to start their books with these disclaimers about how all language is, you know, metaphorical. And when we're trying to kind of pin our language on God, then it must necessarily fall short of God. Um, and the difficulty then is, well, where do you go from there? You know, um, um, we have to be able to talk about God because, hey, so the scriptures do it all the time. And Jesus himself, God himself, becomes a man, a man among men, as St. Irenaeus calls him, and talks about God and himself in human words. And in order to have an evangelistic religion that can go out and tell people the good news, you have to be able to talk. So we need to be aware that our language is always going to fall short, but, but that's just something that we're used to in all kinds of stuff. You know, that this isn't a theological thing about the inadequacies of language, this is... This is every time we try and talk about anything remotely abstract or complicated or important. Okay. So the, the purpose of this picture is to, to say two things. On the one hand, this is, as the suggestion suggests, a terrible likeness of my mother. Okay. Now, you, you've never met her. Okay? She's got arms, <laughs> hair, and like when I drew that kind of three or four, I don't think her legs were quite that thin, even then. Um, she had knees as well. Now, at an objective level, this is a false and insulting image of my mother. If I went with my mother to a modern art gallery and that was there, and I said to, said to her, hey, mom, that looks just like you. Wow. <laughs> Why is your photo up in a modern art gallery? She'd be offended. Or if I drew that now for Mother's Day and gave it to her and said, Mom, I've done this great picture of you. I think I've really captured your nose. Okay? <laughs> She'd be offended, right? And she probably is. She's little tears. <laughs> Why? Um, love you, Mum. Um, but this is a picture that my mum, she's, she's not a hoarder of my artworks as a child, I have to say. Um, this is one of the few 
This is the only image of my mother that, that exists from, from my childhood that I drew. And she kept it and she cherished it. And, and I suspect a lot of people in this room have similarly objectively insulting pictures of themselves that they love. Okay, and the question is, well, why did she do that? Well, on the one hand, that picture captures quite an important thing about me and my relationship with my mother. You know, of all the things in all the world I could have sat down and drew a picture about that day, I drew a picture of my mother. Okay? And, 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 and she, she's the kind of mother who, A, is lovable enough to be drawn a picture of, but also who would recognize what I was trying to do with that picture in the best way I could and has kept it and cherished it. But it's also, it's not a literally excellent picture of my mother. But actually, it conveys, it conveys quite a lot of truth about my mother. You know, of all the things I could have depicted her as, I've picked a garden. When the flowers are in bloom, surrounded by the, the biggest butterflies I could imagine, okay? And I, I guarantee that's meant to be a smile on the face. That's what that's trying to do there, okay? So even, even from that, if you know, especially if you know my mother, then you get a sense of truth that that picture's trying to convey. And all our analogies are bound to fail. But the point I try and make in the book is that that's not a million miles away of, of religious language that we use to try and talk to and about God with. God, God knows that, that that doesn't look like him, you know, that, that the our version of, of that picture doesn't look like him. But A, that doesn't mean it can't convey truth, especially if we can use the words, use the categories that he's given to us. He's told us to use. He's used himself of himself. And really, theology, and, and you know, theology is not a word in the Bible either. When it's good and preaching, our attempts to build more or less true pictures of God and what he means to us and our relationship with him out of these flawed materials. You know, we've talked about Thomas Aquinas before. At the end of Thomas Aquinas wrote millions and millions and millions of words about God. At the very end of his life, he has this mystical experience and he lays down his pen and says, I, I can't write another word or all my writings are like straw compared to what I've seen and what I've experienced. Okay. And that's true. But note that God gave him writer's block after the six million words. Okay. He, he could have given him that lesson before he started writing anything. He didn't. He let, he let him use his, his God-given powers to do the best he could with scripture, with tradition. But then, you know, had a learning moment right at the end. So I, I love this because I do think that we are so limited in our ability to speak of God. I mean, our understanding of God is that there is a being who holds all that exists, anthropologically, metaphorically, in the hollow of his hand that I'm made up of trillions of atoms and every one of the atoms has little electrons going around it in some certain space and time. And yet God knows where every electron is around every atom that makes up me, that makes up you. And what's more is we're just a couple of people on this dirt clod in outer space in the hinterlands of the Milky Way galaxy when there are more stars than we can count, more stars than we have numbers for, with more atoms than could con be conceived, and God knows where every electron is around every one of those atoms. This God is of such... We know now, knowing what we know about science and knowing what we know about the truth of this physical world, we know how great God must be, more so than any generation before. That God would know all of this right now, but know it all for history and know it all into the future. 
This is a God beyond understanding. And we're supposed to put him into our English vocabulary and our thoughts. You know, one of the reasons people got stoned for translating the Bible into English was a holy fear that it would too degrade the theological truth of who God is simply by using a vulgar Germanic language. So that's okay, though. God, as Stephen said, God wants us to use our language. He wants us to use our forms. He wants us to use our vocabulary. He wants us to draw the best picture we can, be it ever so inadequate in terms of the ultimate truth. So we've got to try and explain this being, this God, without simply doing what the Greeks did and what so many others have done, and that is just make him a supersized human. Yeah. You know, human on steroids. That's not what he is. So with that, we move to the second thing. Having discussed the difficulty of talking about God and the Trinity, let's define it. Yeah, so the doctrine of the Trinity is incredibly simple. It consists of three sentences. There is only one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not the same. And that's it. That's the, that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And each one of those, I think we'll get a chance to, to demonstrate this in brief terms. Okay. Each Keep going, sorry. Each one of these sentences, easy to understand sentences. The reason why the early church fought for each one of them, and we're going to we'll hopefully get time to talk about some of the attacks on each one of them, was because they were convinced that it was revealed to them in Scripture, in, in the person of Jesus Christ, and in the, the spirit that they could see at work among them. And the difficulty they had was trying to say all three things at once, trying to do justice to each of the three without denying or downgrading one, trying to keep all three balls in the air at once. And that's what took time. The actual planks of the doctrine, really simple. It was just finding an adequate way of talking about it that didn't get them tied up into knots and, and to say to imply things that they didn't want to. And that's the, the how not to be a heretic bit. That these people wanted to, to, to speak correct doctrine about God. And it took them a while to find a way to do that. One, one of the raps that Trinitarians, Christians take, Orthodox believers take, is that the Trinity is not a term that's found in the Bible, uh, that, uh, um, uh, which is true. Yep. Uh, it's a term that uh, I think we can credit uh, an early lawyer for. His name was Tertullian. Or the triple stones. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but my question then is, and, and, and this is why I think what you're saying is so important, just because the term is not used doesn't mean that it's not a biblical doctrine. So let's take it apart. Plank number one. Is that a biblical plank? Do Absolutely. we find that in the Bible? Yeah. There's only one God. Yeah, and in fact, that, in a sense, that's the plank that, that gets argued for the least because it's just taken for granted by, by the early Christians and by the whole Old Testament leading up to it that that there's only one God was the thing that marked the Jews out in the Roman world and the things that they were persecuted for. So we have the Shema that a good Jew would say multiple times a day. Hear, O Israel. And this is what Moses was told to teach the successive generations and, and truly would be said multiple times a day, would be on the doorposts. Um, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our God, Yahweh, is one. Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one, biblical. And you make the point in your book about 
James. Oh, yeah, there's this great... It's James 2, is it? Yeah, yeah. There's this lovely, snarky bit in... Uh, well, it's not just one. <laughs> in the letter of James, right? When he's... I mean, it, it, it comes in, in the midst of a whole thing, but it's this little barbed aside about, don't you go thinking you're all that... I'm paraphrasing. Because you believe that God is one. Everyone who's anyone believes that. Even the demons believe that, and they tremble. Believing that God is one is nothing to feel special about, because everyone does. This was just so obvious to the early Christians that it wasn't anything to go around saying, hey, I believe in God, that's God's one. That's me saved. Uh -oh. Talk right. to the demons. <laughs> so we've got, we've got the basic core truth that we see in the Old and New Testament. There's only one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each God. We need to break that down. Yeah, well, Father is one of the titles used of Yahweh in the, the Old Testament. It's not one of the most prominent ones. It's used about 20 times, but, you know, we, we hear Yahweh spoken of as the Father of Israel. Um, and it's obviously the one that Jesus kind of picks up and really runs with, really develops. But it's, it's, it's there. It's there in the tradition. So the idea that the Father is God, is, again, it doesn't need arguing for, because this is in the Old Testament background, and it's clear from the fact that our Father art in heaven, you know, that hallowed be his name. This is just not something that, that's controversial. Okay. All right. The Son being God. Yeah, well, again, pretty explicit in Scripture. I mean, obviously, you know, John, John 1 and John 20, the obvious ones. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. At the end, my Lord and my God. Book ending, John. But actually, you know, again, we, we don't want to get into the, the nitty-gritty of this, but the idea is often encountered that Mark, sometimes thought to be the earliest gospel, is the kind of the, the lowest Christology, the kind, you know, you don't get the kind of the highfalutin theological hymns that you get in John's sake. In Mark, well, what does Jesus do? He goes round commanding demons. He goes round. Now, remember that Yahweh is the one who sets the Sabbath off as a day of rest. Yahweh is the one who institutes the food laws in the Old Testament. Jesus comes along and in half a sentence abrogates them on his own authority. When he heals the paralytic, he tells them, he tells it, your sins have been forgiven. And the scribes, the experts on the Jewish law say, who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, the answer is no one. Okay. That's the rhetorical question, because Jesus is God. And we had the passage from the stilling of the storm from Matthew, Matthew 8. Same passage occurs in, in, in Mark 4. And behind that passage, and it would have been obvious to anyone reading at the time, some of the passages in the Psalms, where the God of our salvation, I think it's Psalm 65, stills the storm, puts peace over the waters. So for anyone reading the Gospel of Mark, God, the Gospel of Mark doesn't say Jesus is God, but the kinds of things Jesus is depicted as doing, the kind of things he says about himself, and the vindication at the resurrection of the claims he's been making, a clear testimony that Jesus is God, that the Son is fully God. Um, Paul uses a Greek word to refer to Jesus. We read Jesus is Lord. That Greek word that Paul uses is also the Old Testament Greek word that the Old Testament translators used for Yahweh. As Lord. There is, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, back to one, one body, one spirit, called to one hope that belongs, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And Paul will speak of Jesus as Lord over and over and over again. And if you understand that that's a word used of Yahweh in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, 
it's just mind-boggling to see the Son as Lord, as God. Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit God. Yeah, and this is the this is less explicit in the New Testament. But first of all, if you look at the kind of things that are said about the Spirit and the things that people do in the Spirit, they prophesy, they raise from the dead, they heal, they dream dreams, okay, at the beginning of Acts. They speak in tongues. They're doing miraculous divine things through the Spirit. And also Jesus testifies to the Spirit. He says that he gives the Spirit to the church as a guarantor of orthodoxy, as the means through which the church can forgive sins. Not, not out of their own capabilities, but because the Spirit lives in the church. And one of the early church fathers, um, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, talks about how the Old Testament reveals the Father and points to the Son. Okay? The New Testament reveals the Son and points to the Spirit. And the time of the church that we can see around us, we can see in this room, we could see in first century Corinth, is when the Spirit is revealed in all his fullness, in, in, the, in the wonders that they could see day to day. So Scripture itself testifies to the Spirit's divinity. But the Spirit lives in the church, and the church testifies to the divinity of the Spirit. There wouldn't be a church left. It wouldn't have got off the ground if that hadn't been the case. Wonderful. Okay, so if point one is biblical, point two is biblical, point three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not the same. Is that biblical? Yeah. In fact, it's, it's almost so obvious because the fact, I mean, Father and Son themselves are terms that imply a difference, a distinction. You get the Father talking about the Son. You get the Son praying to the Father. You get the Son telling the disciples to pray to the Father. You get the Son talking to the Father and asking Him to send the Spirit. These are all depicted as very intimate, but not identical. And in fact, it makes nonsense of the biblical witness. If if, say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just different roles, different hats that, that the one God puts on. Because if you think about the baptism scene or at the transfiguration, when the Father calls down from heaven to say, this is my Son, the Beloved, listen to him. Well, unless that's a kind of a, a weird cosmic ventriloquist act, <laughs> then what's going on there? Or at the baptism when the dove's coming down too? These are clearly, in just a very straightforward way that we just don't even need to think about because it's just so obvious. These are depicted, presented, revealed to us as distinct. Okay, recognizing that we're really coming close on time, so we're going to do this in a very quick fashion. I would suggest, and I think that you've made clear in your book, heresies arise when people want to reduce God down to something we understand yeah. fully, something in human terms, they want to turn God into something humanly fully understandable, and they do so by sacrificing one of these three yeah. points. So historically, we know about modalism, for example. Um, explain to us in one minute modalism. Right. If anyone's ever seen the films of Sacha Baron Cohen, Borat, uh, Bruno, and Ali G, right? This is one actor who plays three different roles, okay? And he, he talks differently, he acts differently, he's different characters, okay? In the same way that I ought to act and talk differently when I'm being a dad, when I'm being a, a parent, you know, when I'm being um, a, a grandson. Okay, that these are just different roles I inhabit. And we switch between them quite fluidly. That is completely against the biblical witness that we've talked about, that father and son talk to each other, talk of each other, are different. That these are not just kind of different masks, 
like in Greek theater, that you might have one actor putting three different masks on to play different roles. This just does such violence to the biblical text. And, and Tertullian, who we mentioned before, says that, well, if talks about the, the baptism and the transfiguration, says, well, if, if God, or at the beginning of Genesis, when God talks in the plural, he says, well, if, if God is really singular in, in an unnuanced sense, when he's talking and presenting himself like this, then he's either lying or he's joking. And, and Tertullian doesn't think he's doing either one of those in revealing who, him, who he is to us. So can we say, and I think your book does a good job of this, that this heresy is to basically try to make sense of everything yep. by eliminating point number three. Exactly. So you've got only one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God, but you take out the idea they're not the same. They are the same, yep. just a different mask. Yeah, then you don't have a problem. There's no kind of trilemma there that we talk <laughs> about. You know, only one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reach God. Well, they're just different names for the one God. We don't have a problem. Second historical heresy was one which accepted point number three, yeah. but crossed out point number two. And this is the Jehovah's Witness heresy. This is uh, 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 some others as well, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each God. If you get rid of that, you're Arianism. Yeah, and basically the idea here was that, that only, only the Father is really God, true God in the full sense. Um, Arius, for the 4th century priest, he was happy to call the son God in a kind of a courtesy title, kind of with a little g. He wasn't really God, but he was so kind of, so so much more awesome than us that you could kind of get away with it. But Arius says that Jesus was created, that he was made out of nothing like we were. Now, A, the reason this, this gets rejected, A, is because Scripture just says that Jesus is God. Okay. B, if Jesus is a creature, well, how does his death and resurrection save us? How can a creature save other creatures? Okay. And also, and Mark touched on this before, but if we think about worshipping Jesus as Lord, the heavenly hosts do that, not just us. Well, if Jesus, the Son, is a creature, that's idolatry. All we're doing is worshipping a creature. So again, rejected both on just kind of obvious biblical witness grounds, but it's important to realize that so much of this wrangling over doctrine all came back to the question of salvation. Who must he be in order to save us? Okay, so difficulty, Trinity defined, heresies revealed, we're out of time, but we're going to conclude with two final things. First, you brought the analogy of Gregory the Great uh, to the Trinity, and I think it's maybe the best analogy that, that I've certainly heard in my life. You, maybe you've got a better one. But use the analogy to try and make some sense of this, if you would, please. Yeah, so this is St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, oh, it's Gregory of Nyssa? Gregory of Nyssa. Oh, I'm sorry. He wasn't even a pope. <laughs> okay. So basically, the, the problem comes up there. As we say, one godness is kind of standard doctrine, but as they kind of get rid of the other heresies, it, they, they start to fret that the way of talking is leading them into, into being mistaken for being tritheist. So this says one God, if there's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God, and Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the same, well, one plus one plus one equals three. How can that be the case? And Gregory of Nyssa says, hang on a minute, you're thinking about this all wrong. Okay. Sometimes you get one human, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three human beings, they all share the same humanness, the same substance, but we still talk about three men. We don't talk about one, one humanness in three persons or three hypostases in any kind of complex way. But he says, well, hang on a minute, that's just, we've been tricked by the language there, because what if we use a perfectly normal analogy and talk about gold, golden things? We talk about uh, a ring. I don't have that much gold on me. There we go. Gold ring. Uh, a gold wallet and a gold water bottle. Okay, let's say. <laughs> now, that's a one gold thing, two gold things, three gold things. We don't say there's three golds. We say there's three things that are distinct 
all of which participate in goldness. You know, if you, if you get down to the molecular level, these are, each one is fully gold. It's not there's like a thirdness of gold. These are gold in the full and true sense. But they don't add up to three golds. It's more like, and again, we can, we can push this too far, but rather than one plus one plus one equals three, it's more like one times one times one times one equals three. One. <laughs> All right. So with that, um, we are out of time, but I want to ask one last question. So everybody's about to get up from here and leave. We'll bless them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when they leave, what difference does this make in our lives? Well, first of all, hopefully it enables them to see the way in which God works in history. Not just in our own lives, but how he reveals himself in history. You know, that thing about St. Gregory of Nazianzus talking about how the, Spirit reve the Old Testament reveals the Father, the New Testament reveals the Son. The present age reveals the spirit. This is thousands of years that God's working in, okay, using the messiness of human history to reveal who he is and to try and teach us. We you know, talked about the stilling of the storm, teachable moments in the chaos of history. So we see this, but we also see how, how it is that God can save us and, and who God has to be in order to save us and how it's possible for a man walking around first century Palestine, having naps, you know, um, crying um, when he hears his friends have died. How that person, how his death and his resurrection can have this complete cosmic significance. Amen. So we bless you in the name of Jesus and, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and pray your blessings and that you go forward with the fullness of God in your arsenal. I look forward to seeing you next week. Would you join me in thanking Stephen?